<laughs> and action and welcome everybody bmp weekly episode 158 it is 21st of march 2021 uh, one more week to go in the first quarter of the year it's pretty cool kind of Spring is coming or summer is coming. Now, in the PMP week, we talk about the latest on Microsoft 365. <laughs> and we have to be clear visitor and we go through some of the latest articles from the Microsoft and the community. My name is Sasa Yuvonen. I'm a program manager in the Microsoft 365 platform side of the house. And with me as a co host is. And good day, everybody. My name is Valdek Mastegas and I'm cloud developer advocate for Microsoft 365 and Microsoft. Here we go. So who do we have in the show today? Today, we are joined by no one else than Patrick Rogers, who a few years back already thought about building this JavaScript SDK, apparently, uh, that is being yep. used by a few people across the world. So yep. we're going to talk to him about journey that he's made over the years and what they shipped last, I guess, two weeks ago already? Uh, 14th of February. Wow, it's been already a, a month and a half. Time flies yep. when you're having fun. Who's counting? Exactly, you? exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, but yeah, well, Patrick has been around for Microsoft 365 platform for a long, long, long time, and and uh, the he is the creator of the BMP JS library, um, and that's been used super, 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 super widely across the world. Oh, so, still the bean, beans. Good point. Let's actually jump on the interview right away, and then without uh, further ado. That, without the further ado. So let's do that. Welcome, Patrick Rogers, uh, to the BMP <laughs> Weekly, episode 158. <laughs> so you've been actually on the show before, actually, I think two times, unless I'm completely mistaken. I have, every time we do a major release, you guys invite me on. So this is cool. Um, it is. So we did another major release. I get to come back on the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so a lot of work to get here, but it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. So V4 so is going to ship in? In two what? weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 no, probably not in two weeks. <laughs> okay, three days. Three now, weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not before we, <laughs> before we actually go to the details on the V3 and what that's all about. Can you talk a screen who we are and what I do for a living? Sure. When when I figure it out, I'll let you know. Um, I'm Patrick <laughs> Rogers. Uh, I work for Microsoft. Uh, I've been uh, here a while now, and I work in the ODSP engineering organization, but in the customer engineering team. So we focus uh, not on as much building the product as we do on sort of interfacing with customers. And my focus is a bit more on like ISVs and partners, helping them integrate with the service and sort of, uh, you know, helping with samples and guidance, taking feedback back to the right feature teams and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I focus and fit in there. Yeah, and you just said that you had your 10-year crystal 10 year. order this morning. Yep. So you'll have, you'll have one of these. anniversary ten is actually on Saturday. So, Ooh, yes. any moment hey. now. Yeah. Hey. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I got my little my little five-year one is up there, but it'll soon have a, a big 10-year one. And I'm envious of uh, my manager, Pat's got his 25-year, so that's <laughs> wow. long-term goals, right? <laughs> when I grow up, I want to have 25 years. Yeah, it's very, it's very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> anyway, so um, that's 10 years. Um, have you been, by the way, can you talk about a bit about 10 years? And um, let's go a bit yeah. on the historical things. Uh, sure, so how sure. Did up, uh, how, how did you end up doing what you're doing right now? So. Uh, well, a long winding road. I, uh, I think I've had a kind of an interesting create your own journey career path at Microsoft. Uh, so I started in uh, what at the time was called uh, MCS, Microsoft Consulting Services, uh, as a consultant. So just traveling around and, and doing consulting work. And then uh, after about four years of that, four and a half years of that, actually, uh, there is this uh, joint development program, JDP program, uh, which having the program in there twice is kind of redundant, but JDP thing. And I started helping out with that. Um, and that led to getting to know Vesa better and uh, Kiki and some other folks. And then there became an opening on what at the time was the SharePoint CAT team. And so I applied for that and actually got that role. I joined that team, was very excited about that. Uh, and then nine months after getting that role, we got reorged into Fast Track. So then I was in Fast Track for three years-ish, something like that. 
Uh, these are all rough numbers. And then um, the role opened up on the customer engineering team by a little yep. over, well, two years now. Not quite two years, but a little bit around that. And uh, so I uh, went for that and got it. So I've been working in, uh, in, in customer engineering for a couple of years now. Uh, not quite two years, uh, but but coming up on that. And so it's it's been really fun. And it's uh, I've been doing a lot of looking back, you know, with an anniversary, as you always do. And so it's neat to think back on, like, you know, I feel like I haven't come that far, but also have come quite far. So it's, I don't know, trying to balance that out of, yeah. you know, how I feel today versus how I would have felt 10 years ago about where I am today and, yeah. and you know, that sort of feeling. So it's it's neat. It's good. And it's always when you're moving across the organizations from, for example, consulting services to engineering role and all of that, those are kind of a big reset moments, so to say, uh, especially in Microsoft. It's it's just a, for those who are external, they don't necessarily understand that, but it, there's this completely different organization, completely different world, so to say. So Yeah, for it's sure. A, it's, it's such a big company, right? Yeah. Like every org has its own personality and then every teams in those orgs have their own little personalities yeah. and the way they work. And so you're like, well, I'm in Microsoft, but really it's what in my life, four different yeah. companies I've worked for, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's neat. And I have to uh, historical reference. I, I always love the fact that whenever you join the cat team, finally, um, I announced to leave the GAT team on the yeah. to the same week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so I'm going to yeah. not work with Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to work with Vesa. Oh, bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been working together regardless, so that's good. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> anyway. But now, the one thing what, we, what you worked, uh, like, from a start, of, well, you're the creator of the whole thing, is the BMPJS. And, and the, the BMPJS, last week we had Julie on the show, we talked about yep. the release of Tree. Um, and we talked about the fact that uh, the 16 billion requests generated by, by BMPJS in February 2022. That's just yeah. absolutely insane. That means thousands and thousands of requests every single second in SharePoint yeah. Online through the library. So it's, yeah, it's 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 about six thousand a second, I think. Uh, wow. Julie and I sat there and did the math, uh, which is just sort of crazy to think about. I remember when we hit a million in a month, and I was like, "We've made it!" You know, this is incredible. And, and like, then it, you ain't it, seen nothing. Yeah, and then it just kept kept growing, which is fantastic. It's been it's amazing to see the growth and all the support it's gotten from everybody in the community and. Um, and I've said it on various other calls, but it's been really invaluable is to have Julie as well get more involved, uh, you know, with V3 from the beginning and helping to design it and and having somebody because it's we've had lots of community participation over the years, but we haven't had somebody sort of deeply involved that's, you know, sort of a co-maintainer kind of role. And yep. Julie's really jumped into that and done a, a fantastic job. And it's been wonderful for me to have somebody to talk to and talk through ideas with. And and uh, that's been really invaluable for V3. And I think it really shows her influence. So so what's the secret? <clears throat> uh, let's go back on the V3 in a second. But what is yeah. the secret? Why is BMPJS so successful? Well, how, how, how would somebody else replicate this? Honestly, I don't know. I there don't know one. exactly. Like, there isn't an answer to that. I think yeah. it's it's probably a couple of things. It's probably a combination of a couple of things. I think, and this is obviously it's an opinion. So you know, lots of other people would have different opinions. But I think the fluent interface kind of design resonates with people. I think it makes things easier um, for for folks. I think it makes things a little clearer um, than some other things. Obviously. Everybody has different opinions. I'm not trying to say people are right or wrong, but I think that's helped a little bit. Um, I think uh, we've always tried to be very responsive to feedback and issues. So as issues come in, we try our best. Uh, you know, it's it's just a few folks, but we try our best to get the big stuff resolved every month, right? Um, we've done month releases for six years now. I think we've missed two or three over six years, monthly releases. I think that, you know, regular cadence, and then That's when we've it. had stuff reported that is uh, like a showstopper kind of bug, we've done our best, best to get a patch release out just very quickly, right? Like in a couple of days if we can. Um, and we saw that with V3. We had some, frankly, stuff we just missed, right? With the release and people were like, oh, hey, search doesn't work at all. And we went, ah, let's yeah, we we fix that real quick. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get a patch <laughs> out there. And so, yeah, whoops. <laughs> we optimized um, it away. 
<laughs> so yeah, we optimize away. No, it's it's the classic. Uh, we have tons and tons of tests, but like you can't really automate search because you need the user context and stuff. And so we don't have tests for search, and so we didn't catch that search just doesn't work, right? Yeah. Which uh, at one point it worked, I know, because we sort of like tested it, uh, just like a couple quick searches. But then at some point in the in the process, we broke it and never caught it. So, but we got a patch release out real quick. So I think stuff like that builds trust. It shows you are listening. Um, and I think with the major releases, you can really see where we've gotten great feedback from people, but fundamentally that feedback means we need a different design. Like we can't take your feedback and just like yep, tweak it and done. It's like, no, oh, that's great feedback. And man, I wish we could do that, but uh, there just isn't a great, like we'd have to. And so you see that with V3, we got a lot of feedback about folks um, wanting to hit multiple sites from the same application, like especially in Node, uh, folks wanting to configure requests in lots of different ways. Um, and we didn't have great ways to do some of those things, right? So we kind of blew it all out, and you can get at that stuff now. So anyway, now, that was so, a long way so, to not answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> so you said that PMPHAS has been around for six years-ish, right? So and and in that course, you had three major versions, meaning like three uh, designs in a way. How did you go about, or how how did you experience? refactoring things at scale because it isn't it isn't small and trivial like it's it, it has significant uh, um, surface to it so how did you go you know like you have this thing that works and it's like yeah let's do it differently and then you kind of start from scratch yeah i uh so there's been six major releases uh because we were a long time ago we were sp p and p js i think was the name of the library and we did three versions there and then we've transitioned over to the PNP GitHub organization. So we're at PNP, uh, SP, and all those things. And that's been three major versions now there. So, um, but thinking about major versions for me is it has to be worth it, right? Whatever you're going to build has to be worth the time and effort, right? And then I'll typically, you know, have some idea, like for V3, for example, I had ideas of what I wanted to do, right? Um, and where I wanted to be. So I did a lot of prototyping. I did a lot of, um, you know, before I refactored anything, right? Just like off to the side, not even in the project, just trying out different things. And can I do this or that? Does that make sense? And just work with it till the code sort of fits, right? Or or to me in my head, like it it, it fits together like shapes, right? And it, you know, it's a thing that, that works. And and that, once we got there, once I got there, that feels pretty good. And then you think about, well, how do we refactor everything? And one of the things we did <clears throat> very consciously in V2 is move to a pattern that separated um, what consumers of the library are using versus what the internals are without changing the internals yet, right? Because that was too much work at once. And I didn't know really what I wanted to do with the internals yet, but I knew at some point, because they hadn't really changed in six years, just about. Um, there'd been some small changes, but it was time to do something big there. And we, uh, in V2, uh, made it, you know, factory functions and interfaces, uh, which isn't like a groundbreaking software design, but it's a very effective one. And we separated the stuff that way. And so there's a big change to everybody's code in V2. And then for V3, we were able to completely rewrite the guts of it. And the only code, other than a few little changes here and there, uh, was the setup, the initiation of the library um, from there. So it was kind of thinking long term and over the years of like, okay, we want to get to this place, but we can't just jump there. It's too much work. It's too much change. It's too much churn. So how do we step through that? And it was really like, um, so thinking just about the at PNP versions of the library, like mm -hmm. V1 was really like, get over to the at PNP organization. And if you remember the SP PNP JS library is just one big package. And so V1 was splitting that package up, right? V2 is interfaces, factory functions, V3 redoing the guts. And then V4, I, I don't know, something. Now, I'm, I'm going to put you on spot on a question, which which I could ask for myself as well. So this is, <laughs> let's say, how do you answer this? But so DMPJS is open source community driven, not Microsoft provided. You're a Microsoft employee, but it's not Microsoft provided. It's not, there's no SLA. For Microsoft and no support for it, but it's still being used by thousands, tens of thousands of customers every single month. How does that work? Well, how do? Why? Why is it in, in our organization? Words, how do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> totally, I, I don't sleep well. Uh, 
no, it's it's and I don't know that there's a perfect answer for this because I think it's sort of a gray area. Like obviously PMPJS and a lot of the other PNP things have Microsoft folks involved, right? CLI with Waldeck, um, a lot of the the sample stuff with Hugo. Um it's announced or now, I guess like things, David. PowerShell, you know, yeah. You know, and then PowerShell's got folks in there uh, that are Microsoft people, but they're not driven or owned by like an engineering feature team, right? So uh, it's um, it kind of lives in this gray area because it's not official, it's not supported, um, you know, other than by the community and by those of us working on the different projects, you know. Uh, so I think it it's not official, but again, I'll, I'll come back to. Over the years, we've built up that trust that, you know, if you report an issue, we're going to try and get it fixed in a timely manner, um, you know, and so we've got the, the the history of those years of trust and of working with people and taking feedback and and having good conversations in the issues list and being available and, and you know, understanding of feedback and trying to help where we can. And so I think you just kind of build up this community around the thing or these people around the thing. And like most stuff, right, 90 some percent are just using the library. And then you get uh, some number of folks that will actually report issues and things, which is fantastic. And you'll get a, another smaller number that will actually pitch in and help out. Uh, but all of that is great. And obviously, as you get more people, you get those numbers, you know, the percentages stay small, but the, the, the numbers get bigger, right? That's, I think, how numbers work. And uh, so that's kind of how I'd answer it. You said something. No, I didn't. <laughs> So you said that it's not supported, but so does it mean that you cannot use it? Uh, what does that mean? So let's be specific on that one, because if, if yeah, we just sure. jump so on it's, that it's, statement. It's community support. It's supported like any other open source initiative, right? So if you go to GitHub and you find uh, a left pad, yep. right, and you decide to use left pad, well, is that officially supported in your application? I don't know. Like, but it's, it's can, being supported, right? To be it's being used. supported by that person. So it's basically it's still okay to use it. Yeah. But it's not so provided. there's no Microsoft SLA. There's no Microsoft support, and like that's yeah. I know for some people that's a showstopper or whatever. They want yeah. everything to be officially supported. Totally understand that. But I think that's not really where development is right now. I think there's a lot and a lot. I mean, not even just in JavaScript. I think in C Sharp, it's doing more of this and. Um, I don't know much Python or Go or these languages, but I see them growing very rapidly and in, in, in the same manner. Everything's very open and you can contribute or report issues. And I think that's sort of the new support model, really, um, because like think about if you were to scale that to Microsoft, just imagine somebody might be trying to work on this internally and you get the teams can actually have issues lists. So they get feedback directly from people. Right. And not that that feedback is any more or less important than any other, but you've got these direct connections and you're building that trust across things. And so I think that's, you know, how you say it's not officially Microsoft supported, but it is supported. And again, that comes back to that track record of like monthly releases responsive to issues like we are supported like we haven't released it and it's just sat there there's no issues list there's one version from four years ago like that's not the way to do it right and so it's supported and we've shown it supported by how we've maintained it over the years because i think that argument was much more valid six years ago when we we're just getting started people are like oh is this supported what is this you know totally get it right but hey, we've built up that trust, and now we are supported in the sense that if you report an issue, you're going to get a response. We're going to address it. It's going to be, if not this month, it'll be the next monthly release, or, or if it's a really hard thing or whatever, maybe the one after that. But we're going to deal with it. We're going to be talking to you. And so in that manner, I think it is very supported. Yeah. Um, and I I think folks sh should use it as or should consider it as an option, I should say. Right. Yeah. Uh, across all the different available options, um, I think you know we're there right up with a lot of other options. All of us have been around for years. Like we've been working in this space for <laughs> quite I a know. few years, at least. <laughs> you know, like yeah, oh, maybe you know, like, eighty-four years. You know, like, <laughs> and we're a call when you know, like there was a release, we would all get per post a bunch of MSDN DVDs, CDs, DVDs, you know, we would install the preview version as a and that was the state of things back then. Majority of the tools we like 
Codeplex maybe well wasn't even around yet, or maybe it was early stage, you know? So like the whole open source in the Microsoft space wasn't really a thing back then. And we really approached like everything when it comes to tooling and everything like, you got it and it was supported by Microsoft. Where today, my, like even we at Microsoft build tooling based on open source. So we yeah. kind of use the same. So to what extent, like how does that change the way we look at using open source ourselves, knowing that the tools that Microsoft builds are are also built on open source. It's like it, at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Like, how do you look at that? How do you see that perception change and impact the way people build um, software uh, today? I think you're exactly right. Like a lot of like coming up, there was no, I mean, open source existed. I understand that, but it wasn't in the Microsoft space, like you're saying. Um, and there was, uh, what, NuGet uh, was sort of the first kind of like, I can get these packages from places, right? That was new because it used to be you know, like you get DVDs or, you know, you go write it yourself. Like that's how the world worked. Yeah. And, um, and I think, like, well, here's a way to think about it, right? So you've got SPFX has uh, obviously tons of Microsoft written code in it, but like the generators and all these other things and all the, the build tools and all that have tons of open source dependencies. And so is it supported, right? Like if there's a bug in one of those little dependencies, well, Microsoft's not going to fix it. But like, is the overall deliverable supported by Microsoft? Yes, to a certain point. Like, you know, so it's kind of that balance of, I think it's just the world's changing and looking at this is how software is developed now. And this is how we go about it. And we get tools from everybody and we get ideas from everybody. Um, I think it, you know, just sort of opens the world up because you could be a, a, a developer in a country, you know, far away from other folks um, and still have a huge impact you know, you create some amazing library or contribute to some amazing library. I think that's wonderful uh, to see. Um, I think it's a way to kind of to help build this kind of global community of people uh, developing. And, and you know, just because I'm not sitting in this or that city, I can still have a huge contribution to something, right? It might not be, you know, a PNP thing. It might, you know, go to tons of open source stuff, go contribute to whatever you enjoy. But, you know, I could be a core maintainer of Node, for example, and have never met the people on the Node team. There's people, thanks to the pandemic, on my current team at Microsoft I've never met, right? But we still work well together. And I think it's that same kind of thing in, in open source software is anybody can show up and just start participating. Like, and that's how, I mean, that's how I got involved in PNP is I just showed up and started helping out with issues, mostly by closing them. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, and then got more involved and more involved and more involved, you know, and I think that's great. Um, and then trying to create those opportunities for others, you know, so I think that's, I don't know if I'm really answering anybody's questions, but I am sort of uh, sounding like I am. There's a consulting account, really. So that's why I have a my GitHub profile, or is it in Twitter says recovering consultant? So well, it depends. It's, it's, it's a really interesting perspective, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's it's good for to get more folks involved. So we've been having this, is it, well, Wednesday meeting for past six years with uh, with some of the BNP crew uh, members. Oh, yeah. There's actually multiple meetings in it during the week where, where we have different group of people. But the Wednesday one is the one which started like 2014 or whatever, which is <laughs> super crazy. But I remember in those <laughs> meetings at some point, uh, there was a lot of discussions on, okay, so we're seeing a lot of usage on the NuGet package. We're seeing a lot of usage on PMP PowerShell and growing usage. And then there's no usage for PMP. JS or PMP JS core. Um, I referenced this in the last uh, discussion with Julia as well, because it, I have so vivid memories on that. Why isn't anybody using this? I don't want to, I, I just, I will just stop doing this because nobody cares. I said, no, 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 it will catch on. And then it takes two years for it to become an overnight <laughs> yeah, success, right? Precisely. That's the key question here is that any learnings on that? How, how did that game to be any secrets or is it just coming back on the consistency and I think and it's repeating, just the consistency repeating. I mean I don't think there's any real secrets I'm terrible at promoting things I mean frankly like I really am you know I've if I was better I'd be on Twitter constantly and all these things just pumping it up and I, I'm bad at that I'm not good at that that's not what I'm 
skill that. And I think it's just consistency and it works, right? And it works in a way that doesn't have a lot of pain. Like it's easy to get going, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, now you've got MSIT using it. Well, yep. does that make it supported? I don't know, right? You've got <laughs> you've got some oh, of the there, largest. It's like one big customer who's going yeah. to yell at you when things break, right? Yeah, but you've got like <laughs> some of the largest consulting companies in the world using it in their solutions for their customers. Like yeah. that's kind of amazing, you know, yeah. to think about this thing that we had an idea sitting in the back of the room at a dev kitchen yeah. six or seven <laughs> years ago. And well, now it's, it's a, 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 yeah, as you can. Yeah. And so it's just blown up from there, which is fantastic. Love it. But no secrets. I, I really couldn't. I don't know if I could do it again, like replicate it again. I think it just hit at a time when people like a lot of traditional SharePoint devs were transitioning to some client side work. Uh, yep. with SPFX introduction and learning TypeScript, JavaScript, some of that world. And like, there wasn't anything really in the space at the time and we were there. And so that started to get some pickup. Um, I think it helped maybe a little bit. We did, we started the calls. Uh, I used to every Thursday host this call for 13 people at the start of it all. We're up to a few hundred now, but like, you know, it'd be a few folks that I would just every week be like, here's some more PNPJS stuff. You know, this is what I'm going to talk about today. And because we couldn't talk about SPFX yet for the first, you know, right. four or five months of those calls because uh, it wasn't public. So we were just like, yeah, it's client side development. It's important. And people would be like, sure, whatever. And then like six months later, they're like, oh. And I paste <laughs> it in my content editor web part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good old days. That is actually, I remember when we started the call, like I said, and then for the first five months, we were unable to tell yeah. why the call exists. <laughs> so, this is so exciting. I cannot tell JavaScript you why, but it's so stuff. exciting. Yes. Why are you worried about gulp? Well, I don't know. Just, eh, but, uh, just trust us. Eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good stuff. I guess, I guess it was, a, and Mark D. Anderson, I, I remember at some point where he was he was participating on those calls and then it's like, oh, now it all makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, that's what you've been doing. It was like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess it's the combination, of course, the consistency communications. Um, we've been still communicating quite openly at the MPJS on, on a monthly basis, weekly basis, yep. and promoting that. Uh, it's and and of course the community goes for sure because again you have a location where you can go and come and then there's a similar amount of people well and, and i guess nowadays, like so far so far we did it we didn't mention the most important thing or one of the most important things it solves problem people have oh, exactly exactly right? it's there is a, a clear need yeah. yes for that like right. you can make the most beautiful and communicated thing but if people don't need that like people yep. will not use that. Whereas here, like you can even say, well, I mean, sure, maybe there is room room for improvement to communicate it and get out there and show what what, what it can do. But if the thing itself, if it's something that people need and it solve, solves problems that they have, they will go the extra mile to figure it out, right? Yep. Even if the if maybe you know they miss this one sample or that one thing is is isn't obvious they will they will do that because they will see that hey i can use if i can use this thing for four out of five things that i need maybe i can figure it out for the fifth by myself yeah. and then yeah. share it with others yeah. on a call in a demo in a sample on a blog post whatever right yep yep and it's it's been really neat to see people demo uh you know their stuff on the calls i always love the demos as a always said, but they'll have some of them PMPJS in the demo, right? And I'll see like, well, I never thought about using it that way. You yeah, know, so, and like it's kind of so neat to like see like, so okay, that's cool. Thing I like, that's interesting. Like, <laughs> how do you feel when other people talk about the thing you've built? I, I don't know, weird mostly because I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Other people know about this and are using it and you're talking about it. And I remember the first time I saw somebody else at a conference talking about it, which is yeah. just like, well, okay, cool. You know, like it's fantastic. I love it, but it's just so weird to be like this thing we started is now like just a thing everybody uses and talks about. You're like, okay, that's awesome, fantastic. And didn't Let's you keep have it going. The urge to ask a question? <laughs> no, I, I like, wouldn't do hey. that to anybody. <laughs> 
on line 42 in this file no yeah I, so uh, why, that's no why, fun why do you instantiate it that way yeah <laughs> well, let, let me show you how it actually yeah. is being can i just come up to the state let me just come up real quick uh but it's yeah it's i was a little bummed we've we've always tried or i've tried to every time we do a major release uh debut it so to speak at a conference and just with the last two years and everything else didn't do that this time uh, which is always a bummer but uh you know it's uh it's a lot of fun to see people talk about it and use it and uh I like listening to people like argue with other people about it, like how <laughs> stuff should work. And I just sit there like, do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> let's see what they decide. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe we'll then, make a change. Like, huh, didn't think about that. Or, well, actually, I meant it that way, but hey. Or sometimes you get too. a great idea from yeah. somebody, right? Who, you know, you hear them say, oh, man, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, we could make that easier, you know, and you can go back and, and make yeah. a little improvement there or something. Yeah. And, and so you get good feedback sort of passively in a lot of those forums too, or like people will ask the demo or questions and you could just sort of sit there and listen and be like, yeah, that could be easier. You know, let's go see what we could do about that. And then sometimes, you, you know, it falls into that. Well, that's great, but like, that's a huge change. And what do we do with that? So V4, V4. Yeah. <laughs> v4 coming. Not soon. <laughs> do you have any, any kind of, a, let's say already, thoughts related on v3 and and oh we missed that one we should have actually done i don't uh yet i it always happens eventually but i feel really good about v3 and what we did um i think the new i really really like the new model for example um the a lot of the changes we were able to make got rid of we had like a lot of boilerplate kind of code and we had like uh, these clients that had to have all the stuff in them, like auth and all the things were in each client and all that. And like, that sort of made sense six years ago and it didn't anymore, but this new model, it's all broken apart, but we shrunk the size of the SP and graph libraries by two thirds, wow. just by removing lots of this boilerplate code. And, um, we got rid of a few old methods, like places where like in SharePoint, you had like add file by something. And now there's add file by path. Like there's the yeah. new one. So we just dropped the old one and just use the new one and stuff like that a little bit. But mostly it's just a lot of boilerplate removal. I don't have any plans for V4 right now. Um, I always coming out of V2 knew we were going to rewrite the guts of the library for V3. Didn't know exactly what that was going to be yet, but that was always the plan. And right now I don't really have a plan. Um uh, hopefully Julie does. Frankly, I you know. <laughs> hey Julie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hopefully Julie's got a plan. Uh, well, so actually, <laughs> last time we talked to her, she mentioned this thing. <laughs> yeah, this is great. That's awesome. I did. That's fantastic. No, I really don't. Uh, it's only been a couple of months or a month, so it's it's been out. Um, and it's other than a few things right at the beginning, like search, for example, that we just beefed it. Um, we. Uh, able you know it's been pretty good pretty stable we've had a few little other things we've missed and we're getting cleaned up but that's been good yeah. and then v4 i really don't know um you know might ha i don't have a don't have a big idea right now i don't maybe uh, maybe so maybe if we could turn it around a bit uh what if funding was not an issue you had unlimited budget and manpower like where, where would you want pnp js to go or be Probably on a yacht with unlimited budget and manpower. <laughs> Running a yacht kind of on PNPJS. Yeah, like, I want to see that. <laughs> uh, I don't. Again, nowhere. Like I don't really have a plan. I mean, I think if 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 it were going to be real, right, and there was a budget around it, I think it'd be amazing to have a team of folks, a couple of folks, who could help with issues a little faster, iterate on features a little bit faster. There's stuff that's like in the issues list that are you know like enhancements that fantastic would love to do it i you know when i've got time right i hope you this week fix hack learn have a little bit of time maybe to get in there but uh you know other than that i think it's going well um you know like nothing big truly like i don't right now um i'm excited to see what the community does with the new kind of observer pattern thing we've come up with i think there's a real opportunity for folks to build and release their own uh what we're calling behaviors uh you know, that could do a lot of neat stuff. Um, we had an idea from somebody in the issues list that we ended up not pursuing, but they were like, you should support index DB, right? As a place to stick stuff for the cache. And we looked, we looked at that like pretty seriously, like, oh, is this something we, cause right now we use local storage and session storage and that's easy. 
And we ultimately chose not to do IndexedDB because it's a database. It's very complicated. Everyone's going to have opinions. And so like, there's no, like, I don't want to be responsible to like re-expose the entire API for IndexedDB. But I feel like that's, if you want to build that, it wouldn't be terribly challenging. You could follow the patterns we have for our, the stuff for caching stuff we're doing now and write it for IndexedDB, right? The way you want it to work. Cause like, you've got to allocate your stuff and your indexes and all the stuff. And it's like, I don't know that I should do that for you, but I think if you want to do that for you, I'd love to see how you do it. You know, and I think it was a really good idea, but not everything can be built inside the library because sometimes it's, there's too many options. And how do you, because any choice I make for IndexedDB, VESA is going to have a different opinion. And Waldeck, you're going to have another opinion. Oh, yes. no, it should be like this, those, right? Who didn't like Right, yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> And that's great. I mean, that's yeah. wonderful. That's how software should work. But like it, you know, I think there's a real opportunity, not just for like, that's one example off the top of my head, but I think there's lots of other things. Um, uh, Victor a long time ago said, oh, you should base your whole thing on Axios, right? right. Well, no, we're not going to do that. But we've, I think, constructed it such that if you would like to base the entire request pipeline on Axios, totally doable, I guess. you know, yeah. totally doable. And so it's, it's sort of, balancing that what's in the library versus what we've enabled others to build was a big theme for me in v3 because a lot of stuff people would ask for would force us to change and like i said there were these clients right for each of the different things we have to go change each of the clients right to support that right. new feature that's that's a bad design that's my bad design right it's all on me but it's like that was one of our big things of like we got to be able to open this up right yeah and like we used to you know, like fetch, you pass the URL and you pass that init object. And we used to like have our own init object and we'd get the stuff on it and then we translate it over to the other init object and all these things, right? So if somebody's like, well, I want to use the property that fetch supports that you guys don't support. Okay, great. So we have to go add that property 300 places, whatever. New model, we just expose the init object that we're ultimately going to pass to fetch and you do whatever you want with it. We don't care. Yeah. Like put, put everyone in there. I hope it works and we'll throw it right to the fetch. Like we don't, you know, do any translation anymore. And that's, again, where we got a lot of savings, both in speed and uh, just overall library size. Yeah, I think this fashion point, which I know we're running out of time, but the, we but are. kind of the, the making decisions Burr. related on what do you include, what do you not include on the library, rather than just concentrating and expanding and expanding, expanding, that's not necessarily always the smartest thing to do. You can rather branch off another library out of it or something else. For sure, and that's something we've historically taken a decently strict line about bringing stuff into the library, um, where it was sort of like, that's a great idea, but is that generic? Does that work for everybody? Um, but one of the things we've done, that was actually in version two that we did this, was this what we call selective imports, this ability to like just bring in the parts of the library you need. Um, because like tree shaking is great, but tree shaking doesn't work the way a lot of people think it works. And so if you reference, you know, a whole class, that whole class gets referenced and it's going to get included, right? Even if you don't call any of the methods. And so our old architecture, you imagine you've got webs and lists and items, duh, duh, duh. and so once you've included webs, you basically have included all of the objects in SharePoint, right? And so we made it so now you can include webs and lists and items and nothing else, or just webs and lists, or just webs. And and that was a big thing. So that's kind of a little bit to come back to your point on like growth, like making the library bigger and adding functionality, but balancing that is like the selective imports kind of allows that to happen a little easier. So we can add um, uh, a bunch of methods for, I don't know what's off the top of my head, taxonomy, right? Maybe. And we can add those, but if you don't need them, I just don't import them. You're good. Like, you know, and then uh, we also have talked a, a lot in the past. We have a sample about it, the sort of preset pattern where you kind of create one file, do all your imports there. And that way you don't have to do all your imports across every file. You just do it one place. Right. And then you, it's all just loaded up. So stuff like that has been really good to try and balance that functionality versus size versus what's in the library versus not. Yeah. Um, but definitely encourage folks, if you have ideas for stuff to be in the library, let us know. Not not that we'll for sure include it, but love to hear those ideas. And, and uh, you know, certainly if we don't include it, happy to help uh, you produce your own sort of add-on, so to speak, to the library, yeah. um, your own package uh, there. So. I, guess, I guess a good example related on, let's say, expanding of the library is Moment.js um, and also on the kind yeah. of the success of the library versus 
right now they in the moment JS documentation they say don't use this do not use this you should not be using yeah. this library so uh, we had an interesting i remember way 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 early at the beginning we have a function in uh what's now called the core library pmp is at pmp slash core it's date add and I got it right off Stack Overflow. If you go look how to add to dates, it's the it's the answer. It's got the billzillion upvotes or whatever on Stack Overflow. And I took it and, and credited it right there in the source code. You know, go this is where I got it from and everything. And we got a lot of feedback that you should just use Moment.js. Why would you ever write your own stuff? Just include your own stuff. And it's sort of sure, like on one hand, reasons, not the <laughs> right exactly. And like on one hand, I get that, but on the other hand, it's like. And maybe it's just I'm old and grew up where you, know, you would just write our own code. It's totally cool. Like you could just write that. And we've done that in a lot of places where I, you know, I need a little, I need one method that does something, right? And yeah. so people will be like, well, just why don't you just include this library? I'm like, well, I just need, I just need this one function. It's three lines. Like we could just have yeah. that here. Well, yeah. You know, but and like, so like everything else, it comes with a cost, right? Because like you need to maintain it, you need to pay attention to bug fixes and so forth and so on. Like it doesn't come like it doesn't come for free. Yeah, exactly. As having the code, but then at the same time, if you reference the external library, it's not like you can just just say that. Well, it's their problem because it's yeah, like, well, exactly, exactly. If your library is impacted, then it's your problem as well. So, yeah. but it's uh, it's always tough to balance that stuff, and we've tried to remove lots of dependencies. Um, another big thing that helped us is we in version two we're still supporting IE eleven which means you have no access to modern JavaScript features and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And with the new stuff, um, we are basically like, we're TypeScript 4, which I know is causing a little bit of pain and friction for people in SPFX. And I feel that pain and friction, but yep. it's the right decision for we'll us. Get it no, 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 it's, it's, it'll come, it's gonna be fine. Nobody will remember it <laughs> as a problem. I, I recognize it is right now a little bit of a pain, but what's that? <laughs> what, 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 what was that? Men in Black. You, you oh, oh, right. oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't understand this. <laughs> so <laughs> I talked too long. Uh, <laughs> but I forget what I was saying now. But anyway, whatever I was saying was brilliant. Uh, and, support uh, for IE 11. In yeah, so we were able to drop support for IE 11, um, and and we've upped uh, a lot. Like we've made more assumptions about what's available. Like in JavaScript, like you know, we expect this or that function to be there. Like we expect reflect to be there now. We expect uh, proxy to be there and work. Uh, proxy is the core of basically everything we do right now. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's not something we could do in the past. And yeah. proxy is not a thing you can polyfill, right? And sure, it's, and it's sure a comment that's related on the, on the, all of this modern JavaScript things. I still remember back in at some point when there was customers who said, this has to work without JavaScript. So there's the, checkbox in the IE, which basically said disable JavaScript. Well, I mean, yeah, that page. is still true on the web, though. Like, wow. if, you, if you think about on the web, like not intranet, but, but but web, like that is still a very important thing for many reasons, right? So true. making it true. accessible, low bandwidth, internet access. All of access, that can be still that, done yeah. without the JavaScript, uh, with the JavaScript as well. So it's it's just, how often do you have a website where JavaScript is completely gone, doesn't exist? Oh, uh, but of course they might. Or, well, are, to be are, honest, are, are, to be honest, <laughs> I would like many sites not to work on that because there's there are so many things that are in your way, like all the pop-ups and banners and dynamic things. No, like yep. if I am on a site and I just want to read a, a page, like I want it, I want a text because it's fast. It's but like because of the like, GDPR, you will need to first accept or re reject the all of the, yeah. the cookies and <laughs> yeah, which <laughs> feels like we've gone full circle, right? In my lifetime yeah. of like. <laughs> When I was first on the web, it was just like text pages, some pictures, great. And then all of a sudden, it was like toolbars and pop-ups and all this nonsense. And that Animated all kind of went away. Marquee, and then it was just sort of text again, and everybody was very minimal design. And now it's back to like JavaScript crap flying up everywhere, videos playing and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's, we're just, we're a few months away from dancing hamsters. What's wrong with that? Nothing. I just, <laughs> will indicate a peak. <laughs> yes, uh, and more keys, right? So and blinks, whatever, yeah. whatever else was there. Anyway, <laughs> from a timing perspective, I do apologize. We need to, we need to, <laughs> we need to. Well, so fine. thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Now you will not hear I had about another four hours of material prepared, V4. but yeah. <laughs> It's going to let everybody do a quick V4 demo from the future, but no, nah, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, if you don't want to, you don't, you don't. No, you don't but thank to. you. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. Really, really cool discussion. And, and thank congratulations you for having me. on V3. Really, really, really cool stuff. Thanks. So. We're excited. We're excited. So if you have feedback, let us know. Um, interested in the feedback. Like I said, we can't always get right on it, but we do our best. And so I uh, appreciate everybody who's used it over the years and, and helped out with it and contributed in all the ways. So just thank you. And uh, thank you to our lovely hosts, Vesa and Waldeck, for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll jump then to the weekly articles after that. So um, thanks, Patrick. Um, we'll be catching up for, with you whenever the next major version is coming. So. <laughs> fading away, fading away. No, nope. you're, you're, you're not disappearing. It doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. It's gotten better. It's gotten yeah. better. It's still like, uh -uh, I'm tracking you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot disappear anymore. Well, cool. thank you, Patrick. All right. And Thanks, y'all. Jumping. Thank you. Cool. So, uh, welcome, pa welcome, Patrick. One more. <laughs> <laughs> this is going so well. Totally scripted. Thank you, Patrick, one more time. Uh, really cool to catch up as well. Um, of course, we, we do meet with Patrick multiple times in a week anyway, as part of our day to day work. But, um, <laughs> but still really good to catch up and and hear your thoughts related on the open source and community and and the things uh, i i guess one thing which seems to be coming up in many of the discussions always related on the successful ones and and the things which are having uh, traction is consistency 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 so that people know that it's a thing what you can trust so it's not just no it's out start contributing on my open yes. source thing and <laughs> solving valid problems and getting yes. out there and explaining because like it's it's a thing that i've seen like way back when for like basically in in a way you can think about you ship some something whether it's an sdk or a product or a tool or whatever it is you want people to change the way they they have been going around that thing yep. whether it's like imagine you ship an sdk and they've been calling an api in specific way maybe even for years and now you ship yep. an sdk and you want them to use the sdk instead well that, that's a change it's behavioral change so yes and if you've been building an sdk for six months it's top of your mind six months and maybe you even thought about it for three additional months or maybe more so it's yep. very much it just makes sense for you, right? Like there is no, like, you don't need to explain anything to yourself anymore. It just makes sense yep. for everybody else. It's new. Why yep. would they care? So we need yes. to kind of, you know, rewind and go all the way back to all the different, basically the same thought process you went through. You need to take everybody along with you, right? Like yep. bring them along and say, hey, Absolutely. so we have this thing. This is the problem that we have. These are challenges. Solving exactly. It. Uh, and, and hey, like if, if you want, there is this SDK that makes it easier, better, faster, yep. more reliable, and so forth yep. and so on. Yep. But it all starts with like, it's like, and and that's a thing I guess many folks underestimate the struggle that that is involved with changing behavior and thinking around things yep. of, or others, and even realizing that like it's it's a part of you shipping a product, a technical thing. That behavioral change is also a part of the release, you yes. know? Yes. And which is a super critical piece or should be a super critical piece of the release so that you actually think through how are you addressing that change? How are you making it interesting for the people so that they are interested on even looking into the uh, behavioral yes. change? So like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should have a look on that seems better than my current whatever I'm doing. So yeah. Um, and quite often, unfortunately, we we are well, everybody is busy. So you have this kind of a mental mindset this that, well, I don't have time for this new stuff. So there has to be something which is sparking, something which is causing that well, intriguing, like, hey, wait, I can save time if I do this, okay, well, or whatever it is. Exactly, but it is like with everything else. Like you imagine that you type on keyboard and you do, you don't time blind, I guess. Was, I don't know if that's the expression. Like you taught yourself to type over the course of years and you've been doing that for 10, 20, 30 years. Now, if you want to type properly, you first need to unlearn the habits you picked up along the yep. way. And yep. that is slow. Yep. That is painfully slow. So you need first yep. to acknowledge, hey, what 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 I am doing isn't the most efficient way. 
it does the job, but it's like there are, there are, are better ways, you know? Yeah. And having that internal drive to want to be willing to improve, I can throw at you, you know, the best keyboard set or the, the statistics, the whatever. If you're not willing to change because it doesn't click for you, it's irrelevant. You will not do this. Even if it's the best, even if you would type like, you know, 200 words per minute, it just yeah. wouldn't work. And now as we're spending this, is a really interesting discussion for sure. Uh, what would be the top tips of making that behavioral change or getting people interested on the behavioral change? Well, really so, kind of a, that's, a, that's where empathy comes in along, mm -hmm. understanding your audience, of course, um, who are you trying to address? What else? There was, there was, there was the other day by coincidence, I watched the video by Simon Sinek. Yep. And it's, and it's, it's not, nothing new. Like he talked about it a few years back already, and you might know about it already. You know, the circle where he starts with the why and then the how, and then the what, yep. you know, so like, like really starting with the why. And oftentimes we don't do that. Like we always like, Hey, check out this new thing. Here's a thing. Yes, it's, exactly. It's the what, and it does things this way. So it's the, so it kind of work backwards and people like yeah but why why would i care why 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 and we kind of because we reverse that we start with the wrong kind of end of a stick and the problem with that is is that apparently the way the brains work is that like there are three parts of the brain and decisions are made by the two like or or the the uh, why and the uh, how i believe are uh, re respond to emotion, which are really what drives the decisions. Whereas the what is just, you know, the facts, the features, the metrics, the 10x, 20x, this feature, that feature, you can do, okay, that's cool. But like, yep. you're not deciding on facts. You decide with yep. emotion. Is it yep. reliable? Is it this? Like, is it going to be accepted in my group? Maybe in my team? Do I want to change everybody? Will people think that I am, I am an idiot because I, I use this tool, you know? Yep. So all the kind of emotional things that are related to this why about which we don't talk. Yep. That's you true. know, so once yes. you realize especially that it's kind of... Yeah. yeah, especially in IT, especially we, we don't... And, and one of the key points also as, as for anybody who's building this kind of open source projects and, and building communities is to understand that not necessarily the person who's great on writing the code will be great on actually driving that behavioral change in the audience. So it's the same even with a product. Like you, yeah, in a company, you have a person that goes out that builds the product that that invents the thing, that yep. builds the thing, ships the thing, and then there's maybe someone else who talks about it, right? And the bigger yep. it's gonna like it might or might might not work, right? Because like you can also verge in these very murky waters of yeah, but you will get this, you know, sleazy salesman trying to pitch me something they don't believe in. Yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, it's very much the exactly. same, right? And same like, thing. When, yes. when you have a person who genuinely believes, like to the core, that they are solving genuine problem people have, and they are convinced about it, like you will recognize it in an instance when somebody yep. talks about it, like from their heart, Authentic as opposed to also, yeah, features, Authentic. features. Yep. You know, twenty like x, ten x, this no, feature, that feature. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the classic thing when you go to a pre-sales consulting whatever gig, and then it's like, hey, so check out this cool slide, or are you actually talking about stories? Are you okay telling the yeah how it how the person who's considering using the tool or buying the thing, yeah. uh, making it important for them? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really it's, it's the yeah. same thing with cars, clothing. Like, look at how yeah. much attention is being put into. The way people feel, like you will, you 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 won't see an ad for a premium car. Like, yeah, one zero zero to hundred in hmm, that many horsepower. No, 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 no. It's all about the emotion, how people feel. Yep. You know, the sunset or sunrise, empty road, freedom, all emotion. It's all the about like, with the sunrise and and yeah, the like yeah, if I, you I do this, like PNP. Yeah. Yes, imagine. You know, you have like somebody like sitting out there on patio drinking coffee or looking at sunset and it just works like they did the work in one minute and it just works and like they don't need it's exactly that and they have you know time to enjoy family and do other things they want to do right so maybe that is that some sort of a slogan as well pmpjs for a better life something like that <laughs> <laughs> 
You heard it here first. We are here the whole week. Okay. Super, super yeah, and important discussion for sure. Um, we 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 should write some of this time stuff down at some point for uh, based on other things, but. Today we'll do the articles, so we'll yes. get back on the normal normal agenda of the show. So let's actually do that. Um, that was a super script that sidetrack, right? Yes, <laughs> we planned this for two weeks already. Like, oh, we yes. gotta we gotta talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with uh, this week's articles uh, from the Microsoft Teams blog. Uh, so there was elevating hybrid experiences with Microsoft Teams rooms and Teams devices, and and of course this is all about the fact that there's cool looking devices. Now that we are getting back to work um, and back to offices, but well, some of us are, some so we will we'll be working remotely. Uh, all of that is actually taken into account. So some of the tooling, some of the Teams features, they actually promote that hybrid experience. So some of the people will be in rooms, some of the people will be working remotely, and they're optimized for that. And of course, there's new devices and opportunities and all of that. Um, I have to, that, <laughs> you said such a good thing about this logo, that this image that I have to say, it. it's actually kind of funny to have this image in here, uh, related on cozy chair, all of that stuff with a touch screen, but you can, you can, Touch maybe the screen. You know, it's maybe, maybe too far. To, to I don't know. Touch anything. Maybe yeah, it's maybe. for you know thinking oh, time. Maybe it's you know. Sure. Maybe just yeah, like true. so we kind of miss the context of this room. You know, like maybe it's just meant to you know like that is true. unleash your cre creative potential. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Absolutely. But anyway, really, really cool stuff and updates related on that and and cool devices for sure. The next one is from the Teams blog as well. Exactly. So, so a new feature that is rolling out to public preview now are the Microsoft Teams Connect shared channels. And the idea here is that we can more easily collaborate with people external to our org. So in the past, if you wanted to collaborate with others in Teams, you would need to add them to the team, you know, and from there manage their permissions and access and so forth and so on. With this feature, what you can do is you can add these external guests in a way or partners to the specific channel. So have a more dedicated place to collaborate with them without overexposing, oversharing, and so and adding the burden to manage access. So this will make it so much easier and to, to create that space for folks to collaborate to work asynchronously in Teams, but just in a specific dedicated place. Really, really cool feature uh, for sure, and 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 widely requested. Or this has been a lot of lot of buzz related on this one in the community for sure. Now on the SharePoint blog, uh, there was a new blog post uh, from Mark Cashman around Willits MD designs a legal OS using SharePoint List and Power BI. Being a technical person, the OS is always like operating system. Wait, what? 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 Well, but yes. uh, it's kind, kind of, of it's yeah. operating system, operating system. So basically, uh, they they have a story line uh, with the customer uh, related on building a, a really cool setup with SharePoint, Microsoft List, Forms, and Power Automate and Power BI. So using the tooling which we provide as part of the Microsoft 365 and then building and adjusting those based on the customer needs. Uh, so really cool uh, storyline for sure and a and lot, of, lot of good insights on this story. Now, then we move to the Microsoft 365 platform block. Exactly. So we have another episode of the Learn from the Community series by a colleague of mine, Aicha Bas. Uh, in this episode, she talks to a few student ambassadors, which are kind of, you can compare them to MVPs, but they are still folks who are still at school and who evangelize working with Microsoft technology at universities and schools. And in this episode, she talks about solutions that they build around managing membership of communities. Like, and, and I think they've built a power virtual agent bot. They had some other other components in there in there as well. So definitely recommended to watch this because it's a cool scenario to learn about. And who knows, maybe it's something that you might use in your workplace too. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And there's an it is an open source solution as well. So you can actually access that information and code directly from GitHub, which is really, really cool. Now, the next one uh, is from the Microsoft 365 PMP uh, blog uh, from Louisa Fries, how to get started deploying Azure resources using Bicep. So basically, how did we do automation uh, in the Azure for deployment uh, of 
assets, whatever what resources. Are those assets? Yeah. resources. Yes, that's <laughs> probably. Well, it says in the title. <laughs> it does. It does report on resources. But basically, how do I define that reusable definition of, of deploying things uh, that Azure side have to automate operations and then use the CLI and how do, how do I use the tooling on that? So really, very really cool thing as well. How does this relate to Microsoft 365? Well, of course, the code which is connecting to the tenant is running in Azure in most of the cases. Technically, it could be running somewhere else as well, but yeah. So if you build a bot, an API, a web app, it needs to, and for that, maybe you need storage. You might need database or NoSQL yep. or cache or anything else you might need, need on Azure. You need to roll it out in a way. And Bicep is a really cool way or a language, I could say, maybe even a format to to define resources that you need and to roll them out in a repeatable way. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Now, what's then the difference between Bicep and ARM templates? Yeah, ARM, ARM templates. So they are like basically the purpose is they do the same thing. Difference is between how readable it is, how easy it is to write and so forth and so on. And maybe in a way, preference even. Yep. Maybe there are people who prefer to use ARM templates. There are folks maybe who use uh, the bicep st style um, description, right? So yep. in this article, we see this other way based on ARM templates, how you can assign a built-in role to a user at a resource group, right? Yep. So basically you have something on Azure, you want to manage access to it, how you can do it in an ARM template so that again, you don't need to build a script, but you can express it with a config, basically have the have the state and apply it to a resource. Yep, really, really cool stuff. Now, Appy had a blog post, uh, uh, Albert Jans Kost had a blog post related on limit app permissions to a specific mailbox, which, which is actually really cool as well. So how do I actually configure the permissions and scopes in a way that the application hosted in Azure or, well, not necessarily hosted in Azure application, which uses the Azure AD to get in, will only get access on a specific mailbox rather than too much, uh, too many mailboxes. Uh, because by default, uh, if you have a permission set to mail read and mail send, you actually are requiring that that's an access to whole tenant. So, yeah. So if if your app has assigned app only permission with these two scopes, it will it will have access to all to all emails, right? So, yes. because that's what it entails, right? So there is definitely a need, like why you might want to build an app, but how that app not be able to access anybody's emails, but just one particular email box. Really, really cool stuff. Thank you, Appy, on that one. Then we had a, uh, uh, a sample uh, from- Exactly. Really so, was Varukala. Yes, exactly. So in this sample, he shows, how you can use Microsoft Graph Toolkit, which is the easiest way to connect your app to Microsoft 365, being used in context of Power Apps component framework and how you build custom components for your Power Apps that are based on Microsoft Graph Toolkit. So that is yep. really cool how to basically use the power of MGT, but then in Power Apps. That's really, 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 really cool. And I, I know that Sebastian Levert, for example, is looking into making this easier and easier in the future um, because there's a lot of lot of demand for power apps uh, in the ecosystem as uh, so of making MGT even easier there makes perfect sense. So really, really cool stuff. Then we had a uh, update from Julie Turner um, last week. Julie has been working with Stefan Bauer uh, on the H2O React library. So basically, an H2O is the design, well, it's based on Fluent. Yes, Fluent. I'm just trying to figure out. I'm always confusing uh, Fluent and Fluid. Uh, Fluent, uh, Fluent uh, design language, H2O is an open source community uh, styling library for it. So based on CSS rather than controls. And then what Julie has done, uh, based on the work that she's been doing with the customers, is that she's built a React controls on top of those designs. So it's it's kind of the same thing what we used to have at, actually at some point is Office UI Fabric where we had the styling and CSS separately and then the React controls on top of that. Uh, but nowadays that doesn't exist from a Microsoft anymore. So there's an H2O uh, which is providing that. There, there is of course Fluent 
different set of fluent controls available, but they're always controls and they're always React. So it's a bit of a different uh, alternative. Why, why, why do we need to have this? Why isn't why aren't we using North whatever React North Star or other <laughs> components? Matter of a preference, I guess. So exactly. <laughs> It's it's an open source alternative for some of that stuff, and it's really designed for SharePoint framework uh, targeting that and, and optimized for that experience, because I know that uh, Julie has been implementing a lot of this stuff for customers as well. Then Robert Crane. Yes, then we have an article from Robert Crane about how can you incentivize people who are active on Microsoft Teams and how you can do it with Power Automate. So the idea is that as people become more like, Imagine you roll out teams in your org, and you want to you want it to become a thing. You want it to like maybe in the past you use email or you send send pigeons or owls in the past, and you want people to use teams right to embrace more asynchronous work and more direct work so that not not everything becomes an email. So you want to basically encourage that, and you want to um, recognize the behavior that you want to amplify. And here, Robert shows a solution that you could build with Power Automate to keep track of who's been active on Teams and recognize these people like, hey, like you're doing an awesome job. You're helping us with promoting this new way of work, this change, yep. again, that we want to embrace, right? Yep. So it's a coolly, cool um, low-code approach to, yep. to do this in your org. Makes perfect sense. Really, really cool stuff. Um, also, uh, from the recording 365, Sarah Haas uh, had a blog article related on real-world planner use cases. So, really talking about the different options um, where the planner has been used. Or, this is, to be honest, this is a podcast or is it a video blocking like we are uh, together with Don Michael and Mayo? And, and actually, that's a quite an interesting discussion point also, is that uh, do we use, do, are you using Planner? Where are you using Planner? What is the real world of uh, cases using Planner? I, are you using To-Do? How does all of that relate to each other? Uh, which is an interesting discussion point as well. And To-Do is more personal though. Uh, To-Do is for sure more for me rather than for the whole group. So yeah, at the end of, of the day, it's just another tool in Toolbox and decide exactly. when it makes sense to use this yep. versus to do SharePoint list, anything else you might want to do. Right? Yep. It's just yet yet another tool we can choose. Yep, really, really cool stuff. Thank you, Antonio, Mike, and Sarah on that one. Now, in here, we have then a new article from Peter Winster. Exactly, so he talks about portal apps in Power Apps. If you want to know more about what portal apps are and how they work, check out this article. Really good, thank you, thank you, uh, Peter, on that one. Quite big and, and along and different screenshots and explaining how things are working. So really cool stuff. Now, uh, Joanna Klein had a blog post related on failure to launch your information governance program uh, and what are the common scenarios and why things are failing. So, so basically, understand based on her work as a consultant on this area, what are the common mistakes where things are uh, lacking and why they, they actually fail. So really, really good thinking points and, and thoughts, uh, thoughts provoking blog posts, so to say. Is that a right way of saying that? That yes. sounded good. So, yes, of course. <laughs> thank you, Joanna, on that one. And then uh, our good friend, Italian. Uh, here we go. No, that was a funny face. So I moved it forward. Yes. So anyway, <laughs> we have another video from Paolo about yep. how do you go about ap approvals in Microsoft Teams, right? So in Microsoft Teams, you, we have this ability to, to work with approvals, requests, and so forth and so on. And he walks us through what it is, how it works, where it applies, how does it work, and so forth and so on. So this is a really cool way to learn this new uh, feature or feature. Uh, within almost eight minutes, eight minutes. right? Yeah. So it's a really, 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 really um, snack size video for you to learn about approvals in Teams. Yep, and Paul has been doing a really, really good job. This is episode 197. I guess once a week, there's always a new article or video in every single Thursday. So thank you, Paul, on that one, keeping us up to date. And April Dunn also had a, a new video related on Power Automate powered busy lights uh, for Outlook calendars. So basically, 
uh, explaining the different options and that the busy lights are. Um, and then how do we actually modify those lights and how do we integrate the Power Automate uh, then to the uh, system? So really cool uh, storyline related on how we can dynamically then control, for example, the lighting also from Stream Deck. So would that finally be the killer app to my Stream Deck? So I have it in here, but I don't actually use it that often. So. Maybe cool. you could you could apply to it, you know, auto replies to emails <laughs> or on Teams. <laughs> yes. Reply one, reply two, reply three, <laughs> reply random. Yes. That's actually hmm, interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, so this week, Microsoft has a fix, hack, and learn uh, week, which is kind of cool. A bit slower down, uh, at least in our side. Some of parts house. at Microsoft. Some yeah, exactly. Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> the reaction was like, wait, what? what? Yeah, exactly. Right. But um, so basically, a basic idea is that people can fix things or hack things or learn things. So, so you have to week and you can basically decide what, how do you want to do things. Um, I guess I continue with fixing. So this is. What are you going to fix? Um, I just continue doing whatever I do every single day anyway. So. <laughs> I don't have a specific project to be honest for this week. So uh, there's there's a lot to catch up on and to do. So it's easier uh, easier to focus on things and and it's always a challenge of prior prioritizing the time. It would be nice actually to have some time on hacking, but there's some work related hacking which I would love to do as well. So do it. Yeah, stopping exactly. you. Exactly. Six hundred okay. emails in your inbox. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, cool. Uh, what's happening this week on your side? Anything interesting? Um, let me think. Let me think again. I still, and I, and I think I've been repeating that for the last three weeks already. Finalizing the work around a POC around how we could improve the, the developer experience for Angular devs who want to yep. build Teams apps. There's just like one or two things that we need to figure out before we have something that we can show to basically everybody and solicit their feedback. That is one. Two, uh, we're working together with Alex, and I guess that's, again, something that I've repeated already a few times, finalizing the work on that, having kind of a self-diagnosed way for everybody for their SPFX yep. projects. So, really so before, if you have an issue, before you actually submit an issue, have this one command you can run as a check just to verify if everything's okay. Because it will be a waste of your time to wait and everybody else is like, oh yeah, but you have two references in there and you only need one, yep. right? So you can get ahead of all of that by running this one command and that will tell you exactly, hey, from the Before 20 things that we check, this issue. is one thing. Exactly. Here yeah. is the way to fix it by yourself. And and yep. maybe that will already immediately fix the issue you have, right? So we want to offer that ability. And basically at that point here, is it enough? Are there other things that we could check for to make it easier for everybody? So I'm working on that, finalizing the work on that. Um, other than that, we just churn as we go. We have really cool uh, PRs on CLI for 365 So we're working on that, shipping that all the time, having new improvements, enhancements, new commands, new abilities for folks to run. Um, and beyond that, planning for coming weeks and months, trying to think more about what other areas we, we could help with and make a meaningful change towards um, simplifying the developer experience for building apps on Microsoft 365. Oh, that's that's a lot of things, of course. Yes, yes. always is. Yes, I know, I know. And then <laughs> reacting on random things uh, as well, and and doing that stuff. But hey, it's a normal business, so it is what it is. Uh, on the what, what was I? What was I about to say? I guess nothing. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> 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 Ah, uh, Mondays. Um, thank you, Patrick, once again for joining us today. Uh, really cool discussion, um, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you when the V4 version is out. So that was in two weeks. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> well, depending when you're watching this in this episode. True. True. There we go. That is true. But I guess that's it for now. So thank you everybody for watching, listening, and we'll be back within the new PMP Weekly within a week. Cheers. Remember to use hashtag PMP Weekly to get. Uh, covered in the call. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.